Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. Big win for Donald Trump. That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. As we've stated, Mr. Trump won the election because of his economic vision. He promised to stop American corporations from sending blue collar jobs overseas. Companies like Carrier are firing their workers and moving to Mexico. Ford is moving all of their small car production to Mexico. When I'm president, if a company wants to fire their workers and leave for Mexico or other countries, then we will charge them a 35% tax when they want to ship their products back into the United States. And they won't leave, believe me. Well, now the Carrier Corporation says it will stay in Indianapolis, saving 1,000 jobs. No question, President-elect Trump, using Vice President-elect Mike Pence, put the arm on Carrier. The president can do a lot of damage if he or she chooses to. Carrier wised up fast, and the folks know Trump is the reason. I would like to tell him thank you for uh, going out of your way and taking your uh, holiday uh, away from your family and uh, working on the carrier and employees deal and uh, sticking to your word and going to bat for all of us at carrier. Now, if Mr. Trump continues to fulfill promises, he will gain much needed support in Congress. Right now, no Republican would dare defy Trump after a victory like Carrier. In the long run, there are two things that Donald Trump needs to do to achieve a successful presidency. The first is to foster an environment where good-paying jobs are created in the USA. And the second is to stop the chaotic enforcement of immigration law, which by extension protects us from terrorism. Now, it's quite clear to talking points that the Obama administration and Hillary Clinton put the needs of immigrants, the needs of immigrants, some of them here illegally, above the needs of working folks. For the past eight years, President Obama has encouraged illegal alien amnesty for certain groups, sanctuary cities, and a colossal welfare state. Meanwhile, the folks out in Indiana and other places are being laid off because corporations want to make a few extra bucks by moving to Mexico or another foreign country. Trump said enough. Thus, he won the election. Summing up, Donald Trump off to a good start with the carrier deal. He might, though, adopt a new motto with a nod to Teddy Roosevelt. Tweet softly, but carry a big stick. And that's a memo. Now for the top story reaction. Joining us from Miami, Bernard Goldberg. You're not a big Trump guy, or at least you weren't. Are you modifying your opinion a bit? You know, when people say, I'm glad you asked me that question, I am really glad you asked me that question. It's not so much that I don't think you get it, but I want to make this statement to the most loyal Trump supporters. I'm not an ideologue, okay? Uh, when Donald Trump lied during the campaign, when he was vindictive during the campaign, when he mocked people who didn't deserve it, I pointed that out, and if he does it again when he's president, I will continue to point it out. And when he does something good, as he did in Indiana, when he saved 1,000 jobs that belong to real people who won't be out in the street, I am gladly, gladly congratulating okay, him for doing that. Okay, but it's more that. than that. And, and let me, let me uh, frame the question this way. If Hillary Clinton had won the election, Kerry would be going to Mexico. Right? Would you agree? That's right. Okay. That's Hillary absolutely. Clinton doesn't give a... Uh, bunny's butt uh, about jobs going out of this country. I can't even remember her even addressing the issue. So what Trump promised, he, at least this time, fulfilled. So that, therefore, Absolutely. as a politician, not a guy, not a tweeter, not a, not a businessman, but as a politician right now, you have to say his status is, is moving up, is it not? Absol absolutely. It, it, let, let's look at what he did that Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama or Bernie Sanders probably couldn't do. If Barack Obama or if Hillary Clinton had won, or if Bernie Sanders had won, went to an American corporation and said, you're not leaving this country, conservatives on talk radio and some on this channel 
would have been all over Obama or Clinton or Sanders saying, you can't tell a private company oh, I don't know what about they can that. do. Not but, in this economic climate. Well, hold climate. on, hold mm -hmm. on. But just, but I don't think they would say, I, I think conservatives would have attacked Barack Obama. That's what I think. But just as uh, Nixon was the one who opened the door to China, if McGovern had won in 1992, uh, 1992, not 1992, no, 1972. Was, right, 72. He, he, could not, he could not have opened the door to China because conservatives would have said, He's cozying up to a bunch of communists. So Donald Trump did what would have been, let's say, much more difficult for Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton. But it would, to they do. wouldn't have but had the will it. to do but it. But he did it. That's my point. They he wouldn't did. have had the, the left that's... would not have the will to do it, and and that's the difference. Now let me get on to something that we reported on on Monday. Seventy-five, two hundred and seventy-five nuts, <clears throat> white power guys show right. up in Washington, and the, who's there to greet them? Fifty. Five zero journalists, right. most, most of them national people. 275, right. 50. Farrakhan, and we used a clip of him, routinely goes out and talks right. to thousands of people. All right? Nobody shows up. Same kind of crazy rhetoric. Same thing, just a different color scheme. Can you explain that to me? I, I think I can. I think I can. Journalists are attracted to stories that conform to their own preconceived notions or biases. So if they think, and a, and a lot of liberals both in the media and outside see America through a very dark lens, they think there's far more bigotry in this country than there actually is. So you have 275 idiots out there spouting off Hitler stuff, and you have, according to the Washington Post, 50 reporters. I that know. would be funny if it didn't tell you as much as it does about journalism. Bill, I have the latest FBI statistics on hate crimes from 2015. Only hate crimes involving race or ethnicity. In a country of 330 million people or thereabouts, there were 4,216 hate crimes. That's 4,216 too much, but it represents a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of one percent, but if journalists believe that this is a country that's yep. <clears throat> filled with racists, they will cover well, up. Well, it's also the to idiots. make Trump look bad because they, I, this I, whole narrative that Trump's a white power guy—they they love that narrative. I got to run, Bernie Goldberg, okay. everyone. Well, we were told by the left for, I don't know, a year and a half that Trump was racist. That's the one thing you knew about him. He's racist. And not a single non-white voter would ever support him because that would be insane. But it turns out that Trump had more than double the support from African-American voters than Mitt Romney did in 2012. Not a ton, but double. How did he pull that off? Here now is one of those voters, Justin McClinton, who wrote a really interesting and nice piece on that recently. I think of the Federalist. Justin, it's great to see you tonight. Why did you vote for Donald Trump? Uh, so the main reason I decided to uh, vote for Donald Trump was, was really mostly based on policy. You know, I, I kind of zoned out the media. I kind of quickly realized that, hey, we're in an echo chamber. People are saying some pretty ridiculous stuff. So I said, where are the tomes? Where can I really get the information about each candidate's policy? So I just I, I went to the websites. And uh, I liked the things that I read on Donald Trump's website a bit better than on Hillary's. So what did you like? I mean, what, what jumped out at you? Uh, so what jumped out at me in particular was uh, Trump's policies on e education, and particularly being in favor of uh, school choice. So, you know, the first thing that, uh, you know, comes up under that uh, particular part of the site is him talking about how he's going to, you know, support the school choice effort. I uh, worked yeah. in a charter school my myself on the south side of Chicago, Ooh. and uh, while I didn't agree with everything they were doing, I, I really uh, thought they were doing some, you know, some other good things for the, for the students. So, you know, that was really my, my biggest thing, uh, you know, that charter school support, and I think Betsy DeVos is going to be, a, you know, a pretty good education secretary. And I'm hoping she, you know, they continue to go along that, uh, those lines. What's so interesting is if you look, just to get onto the school choice question for a second, if you look at support among African Americans for school choice, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, it's over 75% in the last poll that I saw. And yet the NAACP, which reports to speak for all African Americans, recently came out against it. There seems to be a massive disconnect between African American voters and their purported leaders on that question. Why? 
Yeah, it's, a, it's unfortunate that you see that kind of dis disconnect between the organizations, and I don't, I don't know what kind of goes on at the head. I mean, there was actually a, a prominent Black Lives Matter leader in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, I want to say, who prior to joining the organization, he was actually, uh, he worked in education, and he had noticed that in his community in particular that the charter school had, uh, you know, they had been doing some really good things for the, for the, for the youth, and, you know, for that, he, he had to uh, kind of distance himself from the organization, and it's unfortunate, but, yeah. you know, those organizations don't always represent everyone's opinion, and, you know, so support. agree or not on, on school choice or any of the other slate of issues, you're looking at this in terms of what Trump is saying he will do rather than through the lens of identity politics. And that makes you very different from most voters your age, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, for me, it's, it's about American issues and, and the issues that I believe in in particular. And, I, you know, I try to vote with my, my head and, and I'm, you know, just, just try to be informed about things. And like I said, I, I like the policies that, that I saw on the website. So you had this really interesting, I'm not exactly sure what this means, but you had this really interesting line in your piece that jumped out at me. You said you went to a majority black high school and a majority black college, and then you wound up at a college that was majority white, and you said that was the really politically intense and troubling experience to you. And you said, a quote, a great benefit of racial homogeneity is allowing for students to pursue educational goals unimpeded by identity politics. What does that mean exactly? Um, you know, so I, you know, while I was uh, at Morehouse, uh, the really intelligent young women at uh, Spelman would often, you know, kind of challenge me on certain positions just when we were having debates on campus. But you know, you could have a debate without feeling, you know, pressured not to hide your, your true opinions. And right. you know, and at the schools, you know, we, it was really just a big focus on, hey, get you know, getting your work done and making sure you're, you're you know learning and getting everything you're supposed to get from a college environment. Well, I feel like you know, at, at the graduate school I attend, which is a pretty large university in California, you know, there's there's just a lot of Fear and uh, people, uh, you know, they can't. It feels like they can't have those those conversations that I thought were so influential and crucial to my college experience. And you know, right. kind of saddens me a little bit that you know they, uh, you know, they had some Trump chalkings, and that that's kind of seen as you know a bit of an attack. And it's like it's something, you know, for me, I kind of see it like, hey, if people could have open conversations about why they might, you know, be interested in voting for Trump or why they they like some of his policies, then maybe we wouldn't have this kind of back and forth where it feels like it's you know people attacking each other and causing all this exactly. discomfort. So if you're a member of the group, you're, you're assumed to be supporting a specific party line, and if you don't, you're attacked. We've seen this yeah. before. Justin, thanks a lot for joining us. That was really interesting. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Tucker.